So hi everyone, my name is Vito Kaminer. I'm a, an assistant professor at the Technion for uh, now two and a half years. Um, and I uh, uh, first want to thank you for the invitation, especially for uh, Reshef and for the other organizers. And I'm very glad that this event is happening, even if it's not in person. Um, my, uh, my group is uh, using electron microscopy and spectroscopy as a, as a platform for exploring a lot of interesting uh, facts, a lot of new physics. And in this respect, I really liked uh, Lothar's statement before the break in the summary of his talk that he, he said that electron microscopes are lab scale beam lines. And I think this is the kind of uh, way we really think about them as tools for doing physics also beyond microscopy uh, and beyond the, uh, the goals of really seeing, uh, seeing uh, high quality, high resolution images. Um, and in addition, part of our experiments are now also showing new concepts in microscopy and spectroscopy. And I would really like to tell you more about these recent advances. Um, and that's what I'm going to uh, focus on. So uh, what uh, basically um, one slide on what we are doing uh, as a group, uh, we are looking into electron physics uh, and more generally uh, effects of quantum electrodynamics and how we can uh, use them for different kinds of applications. We're looking into ways to, uh, to explore X-ray sources and also uh, explore ultrafast detectors, uh, mostly of X-rays and also of, of ultrafast electrons. Uh, we use nanophotonics for enhancing those detectors. We're exploring effects in quantum optics, especially in areas of strong field uh, quantum electrodynamics and how, for example, harmonic generation can be created with uh, quantum optical phenomena. And we use, uh, 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 then develop the formalism of microscopic quantum electrodynamics to study light matter interactions uh, in novel materials, especially in 2D materials. Um, and a lot of, of those topics also overlap um, with ideas of quantum interactions of free electrons. So what I want to use this talk to, to do is to explore what kind of quantum physics we see in electron microscopy when we play with free electrons and what we can, what we can do with them. Um, so um, this is the system that we worked hard to build at the Technion over the past two years. Uh, it has been an amazing journey and also uh, more, more recently a successful one that we got some really nice results. Um, and the, a lot of it is thanks to the really hard work that uh, the guys in my team uh, put into it. Um, in some occasions also, uh, also day and night and with a lot of uh, a lot of effort to make this uh, operational relatively quickly, uh, we worked with a couple of different companies. One of them is IDES, um, that's now purchased by Joel. Um, and uh, I will not go into all those details right now. I'll go into them later on. I, I want to focus first on uh, to explain not the technical aspects, but why I think they are interesting and why I think they are they are important. So for this. Um, I, I want to, to talk about why I think that uh, using free electrons in electron microscopes is, uh, is an exciting piece of physics. Because uh, uh, one of them that we're seeing today that we can use electron microscopes as, as facilities, as uh, let's call them beam lines, but also to, to extract the quantum effects in areas that were considered for many years to be classical. The other side of it is that the quantum physics of free electrons in its most, most fundamental ways is really interesting. And I want to then start this presentation by comparing the physics of free electrons and bound electrons and seeing the differences between them. Because if you think about light matter interactions in this very general sense in uh, bound electron systems, we know for many, many years, right? Bound electrons like atoms and molecules, quantum dots, quantum wells. Um, there are a lot of mechanisms that were developed to control light matter interactions there. For example, Perstel enhancement the ability to increase the density of states in small cavities is now part of technology in controlled emission in commercial semiconductors, even in, semi, in uh, single photon sources. And there are other kinds of single photon nonlinearities that are using the bound electron systems, as, uh, the quantum matter to allow that. We use a lot of nanophotonic platforms. We saw some of this in previous talks as well, uh, like photonic crystals, plasmonic structures, uh, Babinet uh, nano antennas. Um, there are uh, beautiful work done by showing how cavities on uh, small scales, even sub nanometer, can uh, can show very strong enhancements, effects like Rabi splitting. I think uh, Gilad Aran will show more on this after afternoon. 
Uh, we also did some theory work on this. Um, I came from doing mostly theory in my PhD and postdoc. Um, for example, how we can enable forbidden transitions by using uh, enhancements near graphene surfaces, how we can tune optical transitions uh, by using quantum wells bound to um, two-dimensional materials. And all of those are effects that we can see and control with, with bound electron systems. Now, uh, free electrons, if I try to think about them in a this very wide, a very different kind of system. We can apply the same kinds of concepts there when we play with free electrons in our microscopes. Um, and a lot of those concepts were never tried in the context of free electrons. So what I was asking myself, and we are now exploring this for a couple of years, is what are the kind of things we'll see once we apply the ideas like personal enhancement and Rabi splitting to free electron systems. And I think the key difference that is interesting to highlight is that free electrons, unlike bound ones, have a continuum of energy levels, unlike the bound electrons that have some discrete energies. And that makes right away the biggest difference between the, those very different kind of systems. Because if you think about free electrons, they, for example, can access electronic transitions at new energy ranges that we normally don't think about materials being able to access, for example, X-ray transitions. And also, they become tunable. We can very easily tune those transitions. And I want to show you one example of how we can create a mechanism of light emission, emission um, by using free electrons. And this is a, a recent uh, work that's coming up in Nature Photonics, um, probably later this month, by Michael Schentzis, who just graduated his uh, master in my group. Where What we did here is we took van der Waals materials and we sent uh, free electrons in, the, in a microscope through them. And what we basically achieve once we send those electrons through that the electron is modulated by the van der Waals material and is also modulating the atoms around it, basically creating polarization, uh, arrays of polarization vibrations around it that together allow us to generate radiation. And what you can see here, those are EDS measurements um, of the X-ray spectrum as a function of the voltage accelerating the electrons. We scanned from 60 kV to all the way to 300 kV. So we go to almost 80% almost of the speed of light and start uh, below 50%. And you can see that the peak that we get here, and this is a resonant peak um, that is created by this modulation of the electron, can be shifted continuously. Uh, this is in WSC2. We also did that in a series of other, uh, of other Van der Waals materials. And we also saw that by changing the content, the atomic composition of Van der Waals materials, we get this degree of tunability. But in the end, the Van der Waals materials is only a tool here. The energy is coming from the electron. And the fact that electrons can make transitions that are at the X-ray scale and are not limited by specific energy levels is really the thing that allows us to think about X-ray sources from free electrons. And of course, there are many other mechanisms of X-ray sources like free electron lasers and synchrotrons, uh, usually very large facilities and not easy to tune. Uh, and I think that's one thing that is uh, very interesting about exploring the physics of free electrons. Um, but I'll um, do a, a step back into this general comparison, because I think that we like free electrons not only as a me method for generating radiation, but also as a tool for spectroscopy. And the same kinds of tools we study for them also apply to other fundamental particles. Um, and so if I think about spectroscopy, about probing material properties, this is where free electrons are uh, unique in their ability to, to do stuff. And when we now look at those interactions between the free electron and the materials, um, I think the most fundamental thing to, to think about is what happens to that electron when it goes through an electromagnetic field. That could be an electromagnetic field we create with an external laser, like we'll show soon, or by an atomic structure. And this is then, um, the DC electromagnetic field. So when we think about an interaction of that type, we will often ask, well, what's the energy change if we want to measure it with yields uh, for that electron? If you ask a high school student that uh, did his homework well, he will say, okay, we need to take the field here and solve the Lorentz force equation. The force on the electron that gives us the acceleration and later on the change in energy will be a result of QE plus V, Q, Q V cross V. Uh, and that's what we'll expect then to see if there was an initial electron spectrum, let's say this uh, zero loss peak at 120 kilo electron volts, it will be shifted by some energy. And that's really the classical expectation from an experiment of the type. We can do that by, for example, shining a laser into the sample um, or into the electron. Uh, but that's not what we really see in experiments. And I think what's uh, very interesting 
and this is a, an example from a paper by the Ropos group from 2015 that we see, and those are all experimental pieces from the paper, uh, we see this very interesting spectrum that extends to both sides, both to the loss and the gain, that shows us first of all that the interaction is quantum. The electron doesn't go to one energy, but is actually choosing between a range of options. Um, and beyond that, um, when we ask what's really the distance between those peaks, we find H bar popping out. So that's a hint that we need to think about quantum mechanics here. Um, and quantum mechanics, the way to do that is uh, to write the Schrodinger equation, put in the potentials, the vector potential and the scalar potential, and then solve. And when we do that, we actually get an excellent match to the experimental results we see here. The first time that a hint of that was shown is actually in 2009, that was the Ahmed Zewail's paper um, that is now called uh, um, a PNEM or photon induced near field electron microscopy. And this th seeing that um, is really what motivated our group and others in the community to ask, where do we see more of the quantum effects that are hi hiding here in other facilities, not just in electron microscopes, for example, in synchrotrons and free electron lasers, will there be significant quantum corrections that will become important there that we can maybe explore using the high sensitivity of the microscopes. And there are more of, of of those ideas also in papers by the Baum group, for example, that are interesting to explore. So let me show you one slide on, uh, on the theory that is how do we really solve for the interaction there? Uh, how do we really get this ELS spectrum in, a center, in the experiments we're running? So the very uh, convenient way to think of it, thinking about the electrons is to think about them as a ladder of energy levels. That ladder is going to be the started starting at the zero loss peak at the original electron energy and then going up or down by absorbing or emitting individual photons from the field and that is a picture that was first thought of in the theory papers coming after the 2009 Zewell paper um, what we call now photon induced near field electron microscopy and the way to do that is really to start from a Schrodinger equation put a vector potential and scalar potential in simplify that with a, a major assumption here that is very strong in electron microscopes is that an electron is very strongly paraxial. And the paraxiality argument allows us to neglect second order derivatives and get an equation that we can actually solve analytically. This was first done in 2010 by two groups in parallel. Uh, this was like Garcia de Abajo and Massimo Kosiak and also uh, Sankti Park in the Zewell group. And once doing that, we can actually um, use a, a tricks from Fluquet theory uh, assume a Fourier series expansion where the different coefficients here are going to be the amplitudes of that electron being at one energy level versus others, where L here is how many photons it absorbed or emitted. It's an integer quantity. And we can actually solve for that analytically. We can show that those coefficients are a function of some really nice Bessel functions. And the coefficient inside, G, is a number that we can, a dimensionless number that we can calculate as an integral over the field that we create with the laser. So this theory that is fully analytical and we now run it on, like, on a daily basis to explain experiments is explaining what's happening there uh, perfectly. There is only one interesting anecdote about it that I, I really like. And that's uh, my first PhD student. It's going to graduate in a bit more than six months. And when he started working on this, um, even before I came back to the Technion, he uh, actually was really, uh, uh, really stubborn about deriving everything everything from scratch from the Dirac equation. And he sh showed that there is actually a correction, a relativistic correction one has to put in, uh, which for paraxial cases looks like this. In a general case is more, more complicated. And it's actually caused a correction that we can see in a series of errata. He was arguing with half the community for a while um, and eventually won. So it's a good sign for uh, stubborn PhD students and what impact they can make. So uh, let's look at it actual results that when, when we measure this on a daily basis. So if we look at the experimental measurement of eels for a regular interaction, we put some sample, we shine light, and we really uh, see this in almost every sample we shine enough light on. Uh, we find that the zero loss peak is splitting in two. And that split that you can see here is a typically absorption or emission of a single photon. And we can change the photon frequency and that will change the location of those peaks. Now, when we increase the laser intensity, we'll get many integer multiples of H bar omega. Okay, but now what we were aiming for is to not just take any sample and shine enough light on it, but design the sample properly. So the interaction with the electron will become resonant. What we call a phase matching condition, where we match the velocity of the electron with the velocity of light. 
in a precise way. And then what happens is that the actual ill spectrum becomes completely different. There is a qualitative change where the actual energy spectrum, you can still see the zero here. This is the zero loss peak now. Um, and it's very hard to identify that rather than the other ones, becomes super wide uh, due to the very efficient interaction. And this actually extends over a very long distance of peaks. We now got into several thousand peaks like that. So we reach into uh, thousands of electron volts in individual photons being absorbed and emitted. We call those uh, free electron energy comps. And they are now of interest because they can bring us to explore at a second science. Um, and let me show you one, uh, like one and a half slides on how we create them. So uh, when we have a, when we want to match the electron energy, the electron velocity to the velocity of light, what we can do is take a sample of the following type. This is a prism, uh, a, a, my, a prism that whose size is 500 microns. So tiny for people doing optics, but enormous for people doing electron microscopy. Um, and we send the electron to graze the surface of that prism. We have to align the beam of light to a precise angle. This angle theta actually has to satisfy the, uh, this equation. Cos theta is velocity of light over the velocity of the electron and the index of the prism. That's exactly the Cherenkov condition for, for whoever is interested in the Cherenkov effect. Uh, I won't have time to explain this in many more details, but I'll say that this uh, experiment was inspired by a classical experiment um, we're not inside a transmission electron microscope by the uh, uh, Homelov group uh, a couple of years ago. And what we, we were expecting to see here is this resonant strong interaction. And really by uh, aligning this electron to graze the surface. And I think this is the hardest uh, step that was needed here. And Raphael uh, was, was really able to achieve. We achieved this uh, grazing angle interaction condition that was allowing us to match the electron to move along the surface. And that's all is happening inside the system that I was describing uh, briefly before. We put the sample inside a transmission electron microscope where we have uh, several ports for putting the laser light in. One of them is exciting with a UV pulse photo emission from the tip, basically triggering when the electrons will arrive. The other one is the one that, arrive, that is illuminating on the sample. And, then taking those electrons into an uh, electron energy spectrometer gives us the kind of uh, signal I showed before, and it extends over a very wide range of energies. Now to, uh, uh, in that experiment, we reached uh, energy width of about 1700 electron volts. This is a coherent broadening of the electron. By now we can, we can do more with samples that are especially designed for this purpose. And uh, that's a, a, very, a very strong, uh, um, drive for future experiments for us. Um, it's actually a simulation showing what's actually happening there. And you can see the electron, we are drawing it on purpose extended because we really have to consider the electron as a quantum wave function if we want to get the correct results. We cannot take that as a point particle. And that, that comparison is an interesting discussion on its own. The electron is really moving at a velocity, phase velocity of the field. Um, anyway, there is some more uh, theory to uh, describe here, but I won't have enough time and I want to talk about one more thing. So I'll, I'll skip some, some of the theory here and want to say uh, that we, we achieved the grazing angle conditions here. This is something that was very important to us to get. And we see the, the effect of quantized stimulated radiation and acceleration, creating those free electron comps. It's a, it's a really interesting um, effect of fundamental physics, how the quantum wave function of the electron is playing a role in the interaction here. Um, but, uh, but I want to, uh, um, to say, to, to go to talk a little bit more about how we can use those kinds of interactions for microscopy. And for this, uh, a quick uh, historical comparison. I mentioned the work by Zewell in 2009. This is a, a timeline for the community. The theory explaining you see here, the one we had to extend for the previous experiment is a 2010 work. Then the Rockers group showed this work that for me was a really what drew me into the field in 2015. And there were in parallel beautiful experiments on using those techniques to image plasmons on nanowires by the Carbonic Group from EPFL, a lot of other uh, contributions. I think a very important work showing how we can use this for spectroscopy, for milli EV uh, ill spectroscopy, by taking the laser bandwidth instead of the zero loss peak um, as the dominant uh, tool. And this was the 2018. And then very recently, uh, two months ago, we had uh, two papers coming out, by one by us and one by the Ropers Group. Uh, coming up back to back, where we use that capabilities to explore photonic cavities, to trap the light in a cavity 
and explore how the light decays and see the lifetime of light in the cavity. Um, and I want to say uh, just a couple of minutes I have left to talk more about this experiment. So um, what, uh, what we did there is we used the setup that I mentioned before and specifically uh, benefited from, um, from the following uh, idea. We have the, uh, what was written here as OPA and DFG, optical parametric amplifier and difference frequency generation are uh, tools in femtosecond optics that allow us to tune the frequency of light. And we designed the entire setup to use parabolic mirrors in a way that allows us to change the frequency of light we couple into the system without the need to realign everything every time. Um, this unique design allowed us to now start using the laser light as the new knob in electron microscopy, and specifically the frequency and polarization of the laser light. So let me show you what this allows us to do. And, uh, and the, uh, the game plan is now to put a sample inside that we can control with several new knobs. One of them is the frequency of light, and otherwise an angle of the sample, the polarization of light. Um, and this was led by Kang Peng Wang from my group. He's a postdoc in the group, the first postdoc in the group. And now we'll look at samples of this type. Those are photonic crystal membranes, silicon nitride. They're typically used for holding samples in biology very often. We use them with no sample on top, with no material on top to study their optical properties. So that's how a typical TEM image of them looks like. We see the holes here. Um, and what we are going to do now is tune the time of arrival of the laser pulse and the electron pulse. So we create the following image. This is an ELS spectrum where you see the peaks on, the, on both sides. It's a function of the time of arrival. When the time is not well aligned, we don't see any interaction. We only see the zero loss peak. But now what's going to change is we're going, instead of scanning the time, once we know when to bring the pulses, we'll scan over the incident angle. What happens when we tilt the sample gradually and measure again and again? For specific angles, there is a stronger interaction. The ELs is stronger on both sides. And those are the resonances of the structure. Those are exactly the points where the light is trapped in the most efficient way inside the material. So now imagine we change the wavelength of light from 885 to 900. Suddenly we see that there is a different angle at which the resonance occurs. So now by each of those experiments is a scan over angles, but now we also scan over wavelength. And we only collect the points of resonances. And what, we, what is created here, this is a map of the ills from each map of that type. We take a resonance, the strongest interaction point and mark it here on, this, on the figure here. And what you'll then see is once I scan over wavelengths, we see the points of resonances shift gradually. And for people here um, familiar with condensed metaphysics, it looks a little bit like a band structure with the angle and the wavelength. Or in photonics, we also call those photonic band structures in photonic crystals. And that's the kind of structure we have. So if I collect all of those points and each pixel here is an entire yields measurement, is a separate experiment for us, we get an image of that type. So you see as a function of angle and wavelength, we get this the entire description of the response of the material. Uh, and now what's even more beautiful is that we can pinpoint specific areas there, like one, one point on the band structure or another, and each point here is going to give us the mode. So this is a TEM image that is filtered by energy. So we're only filtering electrons that gained energy. And then what we see is brighter points or darker points at the locations where the field was stronger. So the electron here is a tool to image the field of light and how it's trapped on the photonic crystal. And what we know from theory, and there are beautiful books showing those simulations for, uh, for many years, uh, MIT, my bosses there were, one, they were the pioneers in this field. Uh, where you can see the same kind of pictures that we always saw in books, we can really image them directly now. So you see the band structure and for each point there, the block mode, the block mode of the photons. And that, those are the p pictures we see here. So altogether, this is a tool that is giving us uh, a lot of capabilities and multidimensional capabilities, like a special resolution. We now go a little bit below 10 nanometers um, we expect to be able to do better since it's, it is an electron microscope. Uh, we have a spectral resolution, so energy resolution uh, that goes to a few milli electron volts. We're not limited by the zero loss peak in that sense. Uh, we have the angular resolution and polarization control and also temporal resolution, which we used here. Um, and I think that from, uh, so this is uh, in many ways uh, creating the new state of the art in near field optical microscopy, uh, where we compare to other tools uh, like PIM and SNOMs and others. And I think what was really the most exciting for us 
was this uh, comparison here. You see the experiments on top and the theory on the bottom where we scan over delay time and energy on the x-axis. And the comparison of the left and right shows you one very important remark that when we couple to a mode that holds the light longer, we see that the duration of interaction is extended as well. And that's what's happening here. So we can see how long the mode of light lives inside a cavity, which is something we're pursuing for a while because we can really uh, take a high quality cavities and uh, those are having cues of just a couple of hundreds, but uh, see how light is trapped there and how it decays inside the cavity. And that time resolution is I think uh, one of the things that is that the community is looking after in the context of ultra fast electron microscopes. So we're now in uh, contact with, with different groups looking for how we can build on those capabilities for uh, exploring interesting materials because we can use the photonic crystals as a platform the samples as a platform to enhance light and then probe samples that can be typically sensitive to high, intens to high intensities, enhance the light there, and then see what we get from them. Anyway, I will uh, uh, finish by saying that there are a lot of different directions we can explore with this. And I mentioned X-ray sources for a little bit. I mentioned the kinds of, X X of physics that is happening with those materials. Um, and I think it's a beautiful platform for other ideas. I'm glad to discuss further. But I'll, uh, I'll skip this one and I'll uh, leave a little bit of time for questions for uh, so, uh, this slide here. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice topic. Nice talk. So questions, please. Uh, yeah, there is nothing I think new. Okay. So I have one uh, concerning the uh, reliability of the technique. I mean, from the point of view of uh, of uh, lifetime of uh, of cathode, then you use those pulses, lazy pulses, and then what about the cathode and the reliability of the emission of electrons and so on? Is it okay or is it an issue? Uh, so uh, there, there is some experience with that in the, uh, by different groups working on ultrafast uh, microscopes like ours. Uh, we are currently working with that with lab six uh, lab six tips that we replace every um, several months, closer to a year. I expect that to be uh, I, from other groups also. Uh, we see that it depends how much UV light we use to excite electrons, how much current we really use. For most experiments we're doing here, we're working with relatively low currents because we want, for example, electrons to be very highly collimated. So that, so we don't use a lot of electrons. We want to reduce the space charge as much as we can. Uh, and then the, it can survive for quite a while. Uh, there are a lot of open questions about that though. We, for example, don't exactly understand what tip will give us the best zero loss peak. We already got certain cases where the zero loss peak from the photo emission was narrower than it is in thermal mode, in regular operation. So the light can potentially uh, give us a kind of monochromator for free, but uh, no one knows all the way through. There are a lot of open questions there. What will be the optimal tip to use? Okay. Oh, th thank you. Is there any other question? Yes, I had a... I have a question uh, uh, regarding the tungsten diselenide, the, the illumination of the tungsten diselenide. Is it a mm -hmm. kind of a plasmon that you see there that you can tune by the electron beam? Um, so uh, I, I, I don't think we can uh, connect it to plasmons because uh, the energy scale we are producing there is in the soft X-rays. So uh, it's, uh, I think the tunability there is coming from the geometry of the material. Uh, we are thinking about it a bit like an antenna array. If you have a phased array antenna uh, and you design the distance between the ele different individual elements in, a, in antennas, you will actually enhance specific wavelengths over others. Um, so it is the polarizability uh, coming from the core transitions around the soft X-rays. Okay. around uh, our measurements were between 600 EV to about 1200 EV. Um, so very far, very far away from the typical uh, optical resonances. Okay, thank you. And just very, very short question. Uh, those electrons are relativistic. You mentioned some correction to the Schrodinger equation, but what about the exact theory, the Dirac uh, equation and so on? Is it an issue there? Is, um, is there a need for that or? 
It, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, the one correction that we can think about that will come from that is the spin correction. And we so far didn't see that playing any role. Uh, we are looking for regimes where this will be important. Uh, I, I have some theory work on this, but no experiment that I can point on from anyone in the community so far.